In October 2016, Michael Luo, a Chinese American, a Harvard graduate, a New York Times editor, was yelled "Go back to China" by a well-dressed woman on Upper East Side in New York City. His seven-year-old child kept asking, "Why did she say 'Go back to China'? We're not from China." His encounter was deeply empathized by Chinese American community across the country. Because the issue of identity and belonging has always haunted ethnic minorities, it profoundly shapes and is shaped by the built environment. Here, I'll try to examine the relations of the Chinese American identity and cultures with the built environment through the case study of Los Angeles's Chinatown. LA's Chinatown is in the historic downtown area. It was the product of early discriminatory and exclusionary forces. As well as exoticization within the Western cultural framework that constructed the Orient, the U.S. has a long history of discrimination and exclusion against Chinese immigrants. For almost a century, from the 1870s to 1960s, a series of state and federal laws restricted immigration from China and limited the rights of Chinese immigrants in the U.S. Here, I want to highlight the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which was the start of more than eight decades of federal immigration ban for Chinese, until the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act. I also want to highlight the California Alien Land Law, which prohibited the Chinese immigrant individuals from owning land or property. These laws significantly undermined the development of the Chinese community in U.S. and their economy. Let's briefly walk through the history of LA's Chinatown before going into the analysis of its meaning and identity. Early Chinese immigrants in LA lived in slum neighborhoods. They worked as manual laborers, usually in the laundry and produce industries. The first Chinatown in Negro Alley was destroyed in the 1871 Chinese massacre. Old Chinatown, the second Chinatown, was demolished in the 1930s to build Union Station. In the later years of Old Chinatown, the Chinese community began to create tourist-oriented businesses like restaurants and arts and curio stores to attract people outside Chinatown. This is because immigration ban significantly curbed the community's population and economic growth. Also, competition in the laundry and produce industries grew with the arrival of Japanese immigrants. Two projects were built concurrently to replace Old Chinatown, China City and New Chinatown. China City was developed by a group of non-Chinese Americans led by Christine Sterling, an Anglo-American developer. Sterling hired a Paramount Studios set designer to design China City as an ethnic-themed district for commercial tourism. The design was a hybrid of Old Chinatown and Old China, but both romanticized. The district was enclosed by a great wall about seven feet tall. Inside was a Chinese-style physical environment, which is complemented with Chinese businesses and costumed Chinese merchants. They helped authenticate the design setting. Because of its constructed and yet perceived authenticity, China City was frequently involved in Hollywood film production. A fire in 1949 wiped out the whole district. And it was never rebuilt. A few blocks away from China City was New Chinatown. New Chinatown was developed by a group of Chinese American business leaders, led by Peter Su Hu, an engineer in the city department of water and power. They wanted a place for and controlled by the Chinese community themselves, in order to avoid future mistreatment. So they created the Los Angeles Chinatown Corporation to develop and own New Chinatown. The corporate structure ensured the legality of Chinese ownership of land and property, despite laws prohibiting Chinese immigrant individuals from owning land or property. But they still had to rely on tourism, so the design was meant to be Chinese and exotic. So New Chinatown was still a distorted display for tourism, only that it was the community's own choice to self-exoticize. Nevertheless. This choice shouldn't be deemed as voluntary because it was the only way to sustain their community. With the historical background in mind, let's look at the meaning and identity of the Chinatown community.
The Chinese American Museum in Chinatown is a major advocate of the Chinese American history and heritage. However, its buildings are not the prevailing Fox Chinese style in Chinatown. Rather, it's this two-story brick and brownstone Richardsonian Romanesque building. It was built in 1890 by Philip Gagnier, a French settler and a prominent businessman. The building was regarded as the unofficial city hall of LA's Chinese community, as it housed some of the community's most important social, educational, and religious institutions. In the seemingly non-Chinese building, the real life of many Chinese immigrants took place as they learned English and other skills in schools, practiced their religious beliefs, hung out with their friends in, in clubs. It symbolizes the real experience of the Chinese American community. Unlike the Fox Chinese architecture, it doesn't belong to the constructed exotic Chinese identity. The city planning authorities and the Chinatown Business Improvement District are also interested in preserving the historic and cultural character of Chinatown. The former Community Redevelopment Agency (CRA) launched the Chinatown Redevelopment Project in 1980. As part of the urban renewal agenda, unlike in many urban renewal projects, the Chinese community were not completely uprooted or displaced. Instead, they were given priority to re-enter the area if they could meet the requirements of the redevelopment plan. A primary goal of the CRA's plan was to preserve Chinatown's unique and historic character, to stimulate the local commercial growth based on tourism. The presence of the Chinese community was certainly essential. Likewise, the Chinese business community created the Chinese Chinatown BID to improve Chinatown's environment and image, so as to attract tourists. Historic and cultural is the magic phrase for urban regeneration and economic revitalization. The preservation of Chinatown's historic and cultural character is part of the wider urban regeneration agenda pushed forward by city government and local businesses. Regeneration and growth are certainly needed, but it's worthwhile to deconstruct the magical label "historic and cultural" and understand the growth mechanism. In Chinatown, historic and cultural should be decoupled into two separate narratives. The historic narrative attracts only the second and later generations of the Chinese immigrants. They are a relatively small group, and they tend not to spend much on local businesses. The cultural narrative is more profitable. Because it it attracts the bigger group of tourists, who are non-Chinese American, and will come for the Chinatown's exotic quality. The exotic quality is sold to tourists in the advertisements, restaurant menus, and the general ambiance of the place. All new buildings in Chinatown are required to reflect architectural elements reminiscent of traditional Asian architecture. Preserving the exotic quality can certainly boost tourism. But it can also perpetuate cultural stereotypes about Chinatown and the Chinese community. The creation of the exotic Chinatown should be viewed within the construction of the Orient by the West. The Orient had long been considered as exotic. The Qingwazi furniture of the 17th and 18th century incorporated exotic Chinese elements. Chinese opium smokers were put on display during the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. The creation of Chinatown is the continuity of this tradition. It could be seen as part of the Orientalist cultural framework. Nonetheless, it is important to note that the exoticization of, of Chinatown involved the acknowledgement of and participation of the Chinese community. They self-exoticized to appeal to the taste and preferences of non-Chinese Americans in order to be accept accepted into the society. The interpretation and imagination of the Orient as exotic and primitive was adopted by the Chinese merchants as a marketing tool to authenticate the, ex the exoticity of their businesses. Exoticity is at the core of ethnic tourism, so it must be maintained and even enhanced to boost ethnic tourism. Over time, this exoticity also transformed. In today's Chinatown, shops not only sell Chinese art and curios, but also objects that symbolizes modern and communist China, because it is the new subject of exoticity.
The juxtaposition of different historical references in Chinatown further proves that historical accuracy doesn't matter in Chinatown, because what is authentic in Chinatown need not be historic, but must be exotic, old, and novel to the non-Chinese visitors. The built environment of Chinatown becomes a stage, while Chinese people become actors on this stage. Together, these produce a display with staged authenticity. This perceived authenticity further obscures the real culture of the Chinese American community because imaginary and distorted knowledge get perpetuated into persistent cultural stereotypes, which further strengthens the construct of Chinatown. The persistence of the idea of the exotic Chinatown is supported by the film industry and the tourism industry. The sculpture Chinatown Land captures the relationship between Chinatown and Hollywood. Which was formerly called Hollywood Land. Numerous scenes about China were filmed there, and many Chinese people involved as actors and extras. The portrait of Chinese people and China in these films shaped people's perceptions of China as exotic, primitive, violent, evil, and chaotic. This generated negative stereotypes of Chinatown and Chinese people. Chinatown Land also reminds us of another famous Californian entertainment icon, Disneyland. Just like Disneyland is the realization of fantasies and a place for tourists to experience the fantasies, Chinatown is the concretization of an imagined identity of China and Chinese culture, which was built for non-Chinese tourists to experience their imagined exotic culture.